Well, I'd say good morning to you this morning. Good to see all of you here this morning. Beautiful day. We're going to enjoy the sunshine while we have it and the warm weather. <coughs> Pardon? No, it's going to be 70. Okay, well, look again. Now, folks, y'all got some of these uh, last week. Uh, this is a little different one now. And so you have three different things that you should have. If you got one, if you wanted one, and if you don't, I understand. You may notice that the cloud's going to be a little different from the person who, uh, who rendered this. You may notice there'll be some differences on the table of showbread. They're stacked up in a stack. And the Bible says they're laid out in rows. Uh, but the thing that I wanted you to look at most of all was the, the fence of the outer court. Yeah, it's, a, it's not a picket fence. It's a linen fence. A very unusual fence made out of cloth. Linen. Linen. Okay. Well, I'm not exactly sure, but they didn't have to replace their clothes, so might not have had to replace the linen. Uh, you may uh, know that this linen came out of Egypt. You ever see the guy advertise my pillow guy? And his linen he got from Egypt where they grow that cotton. Egypt was famous for the linen that it grew. And it was uh, sold all over the world. It was just uh, the best that could be done. And even today when you see that commercial, you, I think about the linen of Egypt. But anyway, we're going to have a word of prayer. We're going to uh, call some folks out to you this morning that stand in need. Sister Ruth is not able to be here this morning because of she had an accident falling not in the car but she fell getting in the car so she didn't fall out of the car morning brother good to see you good to have y'all this morning but she fell getting in the car and they put a put a boot on her foot has a i think a broken bone in her foot so we need to pray for sister ruth uh I'd ask you to continue to pray for my uh, Aunt B. Uh, had a broken back and a terrible brace and going to have to be there for a good while. But uh, she needs your prayer. She is very uncomfortable and she's 96 years old. And so they, they really don't want to operate on her or do anything like that. I'd like for you to pray for Brother uh, Carol Allen and his wife Barbara. They've asked that we remember them in prayer. Uh, Brother Mike has asked that we remember his sister and his father. We need to remember Brother R.B. and his uh, lovely wife Pat over there in the convalescent home. And I'd, I'd ask you to pray for me. I certainly stand in need of prayer. And we need to pray one for another. And... I'd like to ask you, do we have any others? Yeah. All right. Any others? Unspoken? I have unspoken. All right. All right, let's, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Lord, we have that measure of help that we can come into the house of God one more time. Father, we don't take it for granted that we're able to be here this morning. We know there's so many that are not here uh, because of infirmities of the flesh, sicknesses and illnesses, other things, Lord, that would hinder. And Father, we just uh, pray, Lord, for those that are not able to be here because of those uh, infirmities of the flesh. But we thank you for everyone that's come in the house of God this morning. This morning, Lord, as we look into the uh, lesson this morning, we pray that your uh, spirit will guide us, Father, in what we should say and where we should look. And for all of uh, 
the church family, Lord, we want to lift them up to you in prayer, especially the Sunday school class. We realize, Lord, we've, uh, we've come a long way. And we're growing older every day. And, Lord, we just thank you for every day. It's, it's been a blessing, Lord, to be saved for over 51 years. We give you praise. We love you, Lord Jesus. And we make our prayer now in the name above every name, the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. amen. All right. I had, uh, I had really uh, tried to finish the uh, introduction into the study of the tabernacle, but I almost got through. I don't think you ever really get through, but uh, I'm going to ask you to turn over to Exodus chapter 25, and we'll read a verse of Scripture there in the way of uh, our introduction this morning. Verse number 8, Exodus 25, verse number 8, And let them make me a sanctuary, that I might dwell among them, and let me read verse 9 too while we're there. According to all that I showed thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern, pa pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. And so God is talking to Moses there, of course you, you know, and he is asking them to make him a sanctuary. And the purpose was, if you read the, uh, the verse in your hearing there, that I may dwell among them. Now we mentioned in our introduction uh, not too long ago that uh, Jesus came to dwell in this earth in John chapter number 1, and we, we beheld him in his glory. He came in the fleshly sanctuary, the fleshly tabernacle, to dwell among the people. And God is instructing Moses to build him a tabernacle, a building, a place, for the purpose of dwelling among them. That Jesus, uh, according to John chapter number 1, let me read you just a couple of verses right there while, I'm, uh, uh, while I've got your attention, but uh, I'm not going to labor long right here, but I want you to uh, understand John chapter number 1, where Jesus came in the, in the flesh, uh, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. John chapter 1, verse number 10. He came into his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them uh, that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of God, uh, but uh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So He came and dwelt. That word dwelt means to, uh, means to tabernacle. He tabernacled among men. God in the flesh came. And so He was a minister of the sanctuary, the Bi uh, Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 8. A minister of the sanctuary. A minister, of course, meaning an officer of high and honorable uh, rank. And we know in Matthew uh, chapter 20, verse 28, Jesus talked about being a minister, but he, sa he said, I came not to be ministered to, but to minister. And so he came to minister. Uh, sanctuary is found only in the book of Hebrews one time in the New Testament while it is found... Uh, 133 times in the Old Testament. But sanctuary, I think, is found eight times in the New Testament, one time in the book of Hebrews. It says in the book of Hebrews, as we continue on in our introduction, uh, in chapter 8, verse number 2, in the first part of that uh, verse, it speaks of a true tabernacle. Jesus was the true tabernacle which came down from heaven and dwelled, tabernacled among men. He was the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Now Moses, Moses has received instruction to build a tabernacle. Everything in the tabernacle, as we've been talking about, is going to be related in typology towards the Lord Jesus Christ, toward His works, toward His words, toward His church. It's all going to speak about the wonders 
of Jesus and his works and his words. The true tabernacle. Now that denotes nothing false. It's true. It's, it's perfect. It's not imperfect. The Lord pitched. Man did not contaminate uh, this tabernacle that is in Jesus Christ. It is truly the divine work of God. That he, was, he came in the flesh, the incarnate deity, and dwelt among men. And so everything in the Old Testament about the tabernacle, all those 50 chapters, all those allusions uh, that are alluded to the tabernacle and the sanctuary, they're all speaking about the wonders of who Jesus is and all that he did. It goes on in verse 3 of the book of Hebrews. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat to offer. And so we understand that Jesus uh, was typical of those Old Testament priests. And of course, as the priests offered gifts and sacrifices for sins, uh, for the sins of the people, Jesus had somewhat to offer, and he offered himself. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so when he had offered himself and shed his blood, presented that, uh, uh, that blood acceptable in the tabernacle, which is in heaven, we talked about in our introduction, that everything that is depicted in the tabernacle, the earthly sanctuary, is a picture of the heavenly, that it exists in the heavenly, as we will see uh, later on. But I wanted to make some remarks about the camp in the beginning. Uh, this camp is, a, uh, uh, is something that was, as I began to study the camp, was kind of beyond, it kind of blew my mind, the imagination of my mind in its magnitude, in its largeness, in everything that it took to make this camp. So I want to read to you Exodus 12, verse 36, to start the preparation of the tabernacle. Exodus 12, 36, And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so they lent unto them such things as they required. Now, they had to have materials to build the sanctuary. And they brought those materials from the people of Egypt, where they had been slaves. And so, they had everything they needed to build a tabernacle in the wilderness. It was supplied by the Egyptians. After the ten plagues that were brought upon Egypt, Pharaoh let the people go. Okay? Now the word people in Exodus, uh, I thought this interesting to me, occurs five times in chapter 12 of Exodus, the word people. And the fifth time that the word people is found, it says the Lord gave the people favor. You know, it's favor, grace, unmerited favor of God. And so God gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. So the Hebrews left Egypt with great riches. Uh, you look a little bit further in Exodus 12, 35, it said they, uh, they left Egypt with jewels of silver and gold. So they did not come out empty-handed. They came out loaded. Now in this act of divine deliverance, uh, that God brought them out with a mighty hand, stretched out arm, uh, with great riches. In this divine deliverance, there is a keeping of part of the covenant that he made with Abraham back in Genesis 15. You may remember along about verse 14, uh, God told Abraham, uh, that they were going to be in captivity for 400 years because the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full. But when this 
people over here, when their iniquity is full, I'm going to take their land. And now, folks, we've, we've talked about this before, but when a, when a nation sins and keeps sinning and willfully sins and does not want any part of God, then the land will be taken from them. And they will be removed from the land. And then he told Israel, if you do the same sins that the Amorite, the Moabite, and these others do, I'll take you out of the land, which he did. Okay? And we may be about ready to lose our land. <laughs> about, well, we're losing a lot of the freedoms that we once enjoyed. And now we, they accuse us of stealing the land from the Indian, but their iniquity was full. Their totem poles that they had erected, the spirits that they worshipped, the depravity that they practiced. Uh, we, they, a lot of people talk about leave the heathen alone. Well, we're not supposed to leave the heathen alone. We're supposed to preach the gospel to the heathen. I was a heathen. I'm glad somebody preached to me and told me how to be saved. But anyway, he told, God told Abraham that that nation that takes him captive that he would judge. And so in keeping with the covenant that he made with Abraham, Genesis uh, 15, 14, he says, Also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they will come out with great substance. So God, way back in Genesis 15, talked about this event right here in, in the book of Exodus. They'll come out with great substance. Now, God wrote that history down before that history ever happened. That's prophesied. That's what God does. And we do understand in the Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, as though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. Now, uh, we understand, I don't, I don't ever remember going hungry since I got saved. I don't ever remember the righteous uh, having to beg bread. God has always been there. Always took care of my needs. In all this time that I've been saved. He said he would. He said he would. <laughs> Amen, RV. He said he would and he did. <laughs> I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And certainly he will. Now what I'd like, to, uh, like for you to look at, if you, if you got one of those little things right there, in the, in this outer court right here, what the sinner sees. What the sinner sees. Now this uh, fence on the outside is uh, five cubics high. Remember, we talked about the number five uh, will probably be the most prominent number that we study when we study the tabernacle. And it would be hard to teach the tabernacle without understanding the numbers. So the number five is the number of death and grace. Animals died, sacrifice died, sins of the people were forgiven for a period of time. So, number five is death. Death brings grace. Jesus died my death to give me grace. And so that number five is uh, going to be one of the most prevalent numbers we see in the study of the tabernacle. So this fence is five cubics high. Now that would be, if you put it in feet, about seven and a half feet high. And so what the sinner sees is nothing more than the top of the sanctuaries. That's the top of the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. So that's about all the sinner can see from the outside unless they were tall as Goliath, which uh, they were not. And so the inner sanctuary was uh, 10 cubits high, which would be 15 cubits feet so you can see the top of the sanctuary from the outside 
It was sticking above the fence. Now, the most that could be seen was the top of these sanctuaries, which was covered with badger skin. Now, if you've got some of that material that we've handed out, it may say on some of it, especially those first ones we got in the color. On the back, it had some uh, verses. And they want to tell you that badger skin probably was seal skin or probably was porpoise skin. Uh, but I'm just going to say that it was badger skin. <laughs> now, what kind of animal that badger was in that particular land at that particular time, I don't know what kind of animal that was. But it was some kind of a badger. So the Bible tells us it was badger skin. I do know that they made shoes out of that particular, the, the scriptures tell us later on, out of that badger skin. So it was a tough hide that they made shoes out of it. Uh, so the most that could be seen was the very top. And it was covered in that uh, badger skin, which would have appeared dull. There was nothing uh, uh, wonderful about it to behold or to track the eye. And the scriptures do tell us in Isaiah 53, verse 2, And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And so the uh, only thing they could see was the badger skin, and there was nothing beautiful to behold about that. And a lot of the folks who uh, must have seen Jesus Christ in the flesh uh, must have thought he was uh, more ordinary uh, and I, I can't picture him being ordinary in any sense. Uh, but act, evidently, they, they thought nothing of him as far as his looks. Uh, there was nothing special about him according to what they thought, unless you knew him. And when you know him, everything about him is special. Everything about him is wonderful. When you have a close personal relationship, when you know him, how wonderful he is in all of his aspects, uh, in, his, in his physical attributes, he would be wonderful. He's been wonderful to me ever since I was introduced to him and had that relationship with him. And so what the sinner sees is very little from the outside, but the mysterious cloud, if you would uh, look, you got one of them? You look at that cloud? That cloud looks kind of dark. Uh, but last week we gave, a uh, week before last actually it was, we gave one out and it looked more like a funnel or a tornado. And Brother R.B. said uh, that looks like a funnel and he's just funneling his blessings down on us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And sometimes it... Uh, but this, uh, this more looks like a mushroom cloud or an atomic bomb or something going off here. But now all of this is just an imagination of some mind, uh, a mind of a man that's uh, trying to uh, get across what he might think about a certain thing. Now if we get an opportunity, we're going to do uh, some things on the cloud. Uh, Maybe more than you probably want to. When I get started on the cloud, you may say, get on, get something else. But the cloud, it's a, it's a mysterious thing. It's a mysterious cloud. And anyway, it was, uh, we don't know exactly what shape it might have been in. Did it change shape? Did it change color? What color was it? Uh, did it have color? Uh, but I know one cloud had a rainbow in it. And so we might talk about those clouds a little bit later on if we're able to get to that. But anyway, the camp, we're talking about the camp. Now, in Numbers, uh, chapter number 1, we see the arrangement of the camp. Uh, God is a God of order, and so the camp was arranged. On the east side, there was the camp of Judah. And each one of those uh, tribes had a captain over it. I'm not going to give you their names, but they are listed. 
There was a tribe of Judah, Issachar, Zebulun on the east side. And the entrance is on the east side. And the rising of the sun is on the east side. And then on the south, there was the tribe of uh, Reuben and uh, the tribe of uh, Simeon and the tribe of Gad that were on the south side. And they each had captains over their tribes. Then on the west side, there was the, uh, the tribe of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. On the west side, that would be the very end of the tabernacle. And, of course, uh, on the north side, there was the tribe of Dan, Asher, and Niphtali. And uh, the tribe of Levi was not made mention of. And so they were left out. But all of these tribes are numbered over there in that uh, book of Numbers, chapter number 1. That's why it's called the book of Numbers. But anyway, the camp, all of these tribes were numbered from 20 years old and up, men that were able to go to war. And the number of them was 603,550 men, 20 years old and up. Now, if we included just one child and one woman, in that number, that would be 1,810,650 people, uh, which, of course, there would probably be more children than women than there would be men. Now, remember, the tribe of Levi is left out. They're not counted. Also, the ones that are not counted are the mixed multitudes, those who are not Hebrews, that was among this bunch of folks that came out of Egypt. Amen? So that's a bunch of people. A bunch of people. Now, the camps of the priests were in between. The tents of the priests were in between the tents of the people and the tabernacle. Remember, we, we made mention of it earlier. The priests always camped between the people and the tabernacle. Tabernacle, priest, people. All right? Moses, Aaron, and Aaron's sons encamped on the east between the tribes of Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. Zebulun. Numbers 153. Now the reason for this is given in verse 53 of Numbers chapter 1. But the Levites shall pitch round about the tabernacle of the testimony that there be no wrath upon the congregation of the children of Israel. And the Levites shall keep the charge of the tabernacle of testimony. And so there always has to be a go-between. Job longed for a daysman that would take hold of God and reach down to him. Now, we understand that our intercessor is the Lord Jesus Christ, that he has reached up to God and satisfied God with his righteousness, and he has reached down to sinful man, and he has brought us together. He is our high priest. He is doing this duty so the wrath of God does not fall on the people. Now, in Numbers chapter 3, verse 23, there are the Gershom and the son, his sons on the west between the tribe of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. Numbers 3.29, Korhath on the south between the tribes of Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. Numbers 3.33, the families of Moriah on the north between Dan, Asher, and Niphtali. Now the Levites were the priests, the go-betweens, the intercessors, mediators between God and Israel. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24, 25, and 26, the Bible says, But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he is able also to save to the uttermost them that cometh unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession. 
For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. So our intercessor, who died once, who will never die again, is our intercessor, our great high priest. So the wrath of God does not fall on us. That's what he is doing now, every moment that we exist. He is making intercession for us. In verse 25 of uh, that uh, chapter uh, in Hebrews, verse, uh, chapter 7, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession. Wherefore, because, that, because of all that the apostle has said, wherefore, up until this point, all that Jesus was, all that he has related about Jesus being our great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so he is referring back to all that Jesus has done and did up to this point. Now he is able to save. And so he's telling these Jews, because of all that uh, has, he has told them about Jesus, take courage, be of good cheer, be assured he ever liveth. He died once to sin, but he is alive forevermore. Amen. And he has the keys of death and hell. So he is able, able that his, he has been invested with all power and authority. In Matthew chapter 28, verse number 18, the Bible tells us, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And so our high priest has all power and authority. Even in Daniel chapter 7, verse number 14, Daniel makes a prediction about this one. Daniel saw in a night vision one like the Son of Man, and there was given unto him dominion and glory and a kingdom, and all people, nations, and languages should serve him. All his authority. He's able to save to the uttermost. Uttermost is found some eight times in the New Testament. And it, uh, one time in the book of Hebrews, meaning extreme, being in the furthest, the greatest, uh, of highest degree. Save to the uttermost. Uh, we've talked about eternal security in here over and over and over again. Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. As long as he's alive, I'm going to be alive. Brother R.B. Amen, amen, brother. That's good. But anyway, those, uh, those priests had that job in the figure and in the type of Jesus that was going to come. You may remember that the people did sin in, uh, in the wilderness. And uh, I guess in Psalms 106, it talks about some of the uh, plagues that fell on the people. Uh, Phineas, the son of Eliezer, was a priest in uh, Psalms 106, verse 30. Uh, but he executed judgment, and the plague was stayed. In that plague, 24,000 died in Numbers 25, uh, 9. 24,000 people died of the plague. Uh, you may remember that that plague was uh, introduced by Balaam, to Balak and showed uh, he, he instructed them how to make the children of Israel sin. And uh, they were coming into the Moabite women, and because of that, there was a plague. And Phinehas went in and uh, he killed a man and a woman, and uh, the plague was stayed. Sometimes it, it's very serious uh, when. Uh, when you have to deal with the plague, sometimes it brings death. And he did, and when he killed the man and the woman, the plague was stayed. 
But 24,000 people had already died. You may remember, too, in Numbers chapter 16, verse number 48, Aaron uh, stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. Because wrath had gone out from the Lord, and Aaron stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. Plague comes because of man's sin and man's rebellion against God. In Psalms 106, verse 23, it says, uh, Therefore he said that he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. They forgot God, their Savior. And because they forgot God and turned to their wickedness and their depravity, the plague came. <laughs> Moses intercedes in Exodus uh, 32, verse 32. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, this, he, Moses is talking to God, and if not, blot me out, of thy book which thou hast written. Jesus, our high priest, is making intercession for us. And because he's alive forevermore, because he has been given all power and authority in heaven and earth, he intercedes on our behalf. He is our high priest seated at the right hand of the Father. To intercede means to Pass between. You may remember Genesis 15, 17. There was a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between the pieces. Intercede, it means to pass between. While Abraham in that chapter, he was overcome with blackness and horror, the burning furnace and the lamp began to pass between the pieces of the animals that were sacrificed, that were cut. And so God passed between the pieces to intercede on the half of Abraham there as Jesus uh, passed between us and the wrath of God. Now the act of intercession between two parties with differences Dear folks, I hate to tell you, but we were sinners <laughs> before Jesus Christ. Now, I know that some of you have been in church all your life. And I, I praise God for that. Amen. Uh, but all of us hadn't been in church all of our life. But we were all still sinners. Amen. We were all depraved heathens in the sight of God until Jesus Christ came and shed his precious blood, and we acknowledge that sacrifice and we're saved. Amen. And so Jesus Christ came between the two parties with differences. With a view of bringing them together as one. If you read John chapter number 17 in the high priestly prayer that Jesus prayed, he said, make them one, even as we are one. That's a family member. Because I've been adopted. And my name's written down. And I didn't have nothing to do with that adoption, but Jesus Christ shed his precious blood that I could be a family member and be in his family. And he is interceding now on my behalf. You see, Christ is doing this for us every moment, assuring our standing before God as our high priest. We stand before God in perfection because of what Jesus has done. Clothed with righteousness and glory, we have our perfection, our perfection through the cleansing power of His blood. 
Now the camp, the placement of the camp. God is the God of order. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 33, God is not the author of confusion. Order characterizes God and God's work. It's never going to be out of order. Uh, now, folks, everybody's going to be looking to the skies tomorrow. They're going to be looking for the moon to come across the sun. And uh, God knew it was going to happen because he ordained all of those heavenly uh, bodies up there in their certain paths. I was ta uh, listening to uh, some of the folks talking about the moon shots, you know. They had their, all their plans and their mathematics, and they had the rocket down here, and they were going to shoot over here. But the moon was way over here. They're not shooting at the moon. They're shooting where the moon's going to be. They know that the order of the moon is projecting it'll be right here when the rocket gets right there the moon will be there and they can land on the moon they've done it already <laughs> they're going to do it again they say but man has been to the moon anyway they know where it's going to be because God has set everything in order just like it's supposed to be. As a matter of fact, I was reading there's the thing out there. It's called the Kyber Belt. It's a bunch of icicles floating around the earth. Anybody ever heard of the Kyber Belt? Oh, thank you, thank you. I thought I was. Whew. Anyway, if we have a lack of water, every now and then one of them uh, icicles will break loose. It's big, big chunks of ice. And we'll get a little refreshing water here in our atmosphere. Now, I don't understand that because it's God did it. You know what I'm saying? That, that universe is infinite like God is infinite, like numbers are infinite. Uh, all of that testified of God's great mi miracles and wonders and works that he has performed. So order characterizes God's work in the creation, in the little flowers that you see, in the trees that you see, in the birds that sing. It's all talking about God and his wonders. Now, folks, the church is supposed to be organized, too. We're supposed to have order. I think we're supposed to have bishops and deacons and uh, Carry on in order. In 1 Corinthians 14, 40, the Bible said, Let all things be done decently and in order. The church is supposed to be done decently and in order. Now, there are, let's see, five gifts to the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And so the number five, we see there again, the gifts to the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists. Pastors, teachers. So that's a gift to the church. There is a place of assignment. And uh, this tabernacle that we're talking about and all of this we've been talking about is not human agreement, it's divine appointment. God has arranged it. God has appointed it. Now each tribe was to pitch by the pitch their tent by their standard. In other words, they had a standard. It was like a, a flag. And they had four different flags that they were to pitch by. Each camp was to pitch by. And now, uh, I know there today, there are a lot, of, a lot of folks don't want to raise their flag, don't want to tell you what they are. They're community. We're a community church. We're a non-denominational that means they don't know what they believe and you can believe what you want to believe and i can believe what i want to believe but we'll all be united no you're not going to be united if one of you believes one thing and one of you believe another you're not going to be united but uh, we need to believe what the book has to tell us amen always believe what the book has to say So they were to pitch by their standard. Now, uh, the rabbinical schools testify to the fact or teach the fact 
that the ensign or the standard of Judah was the face of a lion or a lion. We're familiar with the lion of the tribe of Judah. The book of Matthew, he's a lion of the tribe of Judah. And they say they were, uh, they were to pitch by that standard. That would be on the east. Then there was the ensign of Reuben. It was to be the likeness of a man. He's the perfect man. It would uh, coincide with the gospel of Luke. Uh, the tribes of Ephraim, they were to pitch by their standard, which was an ox. Uh, he, was, he is a suffering servant. The ox uh, plows the field for man and uh, produces the food that man uh, would eat and necessary things to supply for man, and that would uh, be associated with the gospel of Mark, the suffering servant, the ox. Then the tribe of Dan was to pitch by his standard, which was an eagle, the symbol of an eagle. Uh, the Gospel of John, he sees all, knows all, the divine Son. And so each one would seek out his standard and pitch his tent by that standard. Now, uh, if we read in the Song of Solomon, I guess we could say, uh, well, along with Solomon, uh, he brought me into his banquet in the house and his banner over me was love. We have this uh, symbol back here. We got a red cross in the blue field with white. Symbolizing his death that he died for me. His blood that he shed for me. And that's where we need to pitch our tent. We need to drive our stakes down. And don't be removed from that symbol and that sign. The Bible tells us in Numbers chapter 2, verse number 2, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign of their father's house far off, it says. Far off about the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. So the standard, it is an ensign, it is a banner or a flag of identification. Now, folks, we need to identify as his. Come on now. We're his. We belong to him. We ought to identify with him. Never be ashamed of him. If you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father and the angels which are in heaven. Don't be ashamed. Identify as his. Pitch our tent by that standard. His banner over me was love. Now the Jewish rabbis believe that the distance, it says here, afar off, to pitch afar off, they believe that distance to be 2,000 cubits because of Joshua chapter 3, verse 4. You remember when they crossed the River Jordan and the ark went across and they told the people, stay back 2,000 cubits. Stay back 2,000 cubits. Now, if I'm not mistaken, that's over half a mile. A mile, 5,280 feet. Okay. I remember that from grammar school. 5,280 feet. Well, good. I'm glad you retained something. That's good when you remember. So it's over half a mile away. They also believe that distance was to be a Sabbath day's journey. You couldn't travel any further on the Sabbath day away from uh, your residence, but they believe it to be 2,000 cubits. You read about a lot about the Sabbath day's journey in the New Testament. 
But anyway, that's what they believe. But we do know that it says afar off. You're not supposed to be too close. You're supposed to have the priest between, not be too close to the tabernacle. And so that would be 3,000 feet away from the tabernacle. 2,000 cubits would be 3,000 feet. Away from the tabernacle, that's over half a mile away before the first tent is pitched. And you see how big this camp is going to get to be. And this would be a very large camp. It's bigger than I could really imagine when uh, I began to think about it and begin to talk to some other people about it, trying not to rely just on what I was uh, figuring. But I did talk to some other uh, learned uh, preachers. <laughs> So it would be far from the center of the edge of, the, uh, of this uh, tabernacle where they would begin their first tent. And some of these rabbis believe it would be 12 miles from the center to the edge of the camp. And if you went 12 miles the other way, that would be 24 miles. And then if you started uh, multiplying out uh, square feet, I didn't, even, I didn't even bother multiplying square feet, but it would be over 700 square feet. Square miles, excuse me, miles. I said foot. Whew. Miles. 700 square miles. That's bigger than Gwinnett County. There's a million people in Gwinnett County, and it looked like it's about to bust at the seams. There's so many people over. But there's three million people here. 700 square miles. Now, that's a big, big, big camp. And God has got to care for all these people. So he is a big God. He is a great God. He is a gracious God. And they were to have signs in the wilderness, according to the Bible, and uh, signs in the sea and signs in the wilderness. We remember they went across that Red Sea, and uh, if they made it across in one night, that'd be three million people that made a crossing. I'm not sure where they made the crossing, but in a very uh, narrow place, they would have to go across at least 5,000 abreast, you know, which would, uh, the, the waters would have to roll back about three miles in order to get three million people across in one night. So he rolled the waters back. Signs in the wilderness. No signs in the wilderness. Uh, it would take uh, 1,500 tons of food to feed three million people in one day 1500 tons of food about 11 million gallons of water to feed them daily you know they had animals along with them besides uh besides all the people they had uh, sheep and goats and all kinds of animals the Bible tells us in uh, Psalms uh, 78, verse 16, uh, about manna that fell from heaven. It rained manna, the corn of heaven. Man did eat angels' food. It tells us also in uh, verse 24 and 25 that there came streams out of the rock like rivers that God fed those people and watered those people daily with that much food and that much water. And I can only ask, how great is God? <laughs> but now He cares for us, amen? He cares daily for us. No wonder all the nations around about were fearful of this great company of folks that they saw coming. Uh, you may remember that the people uh, fell a-lusting in Numbers chapter 11, uh, and uh, they wanted meat to eat. We're tired of manna. We're tired of angel food. 
<laughs> wow. But they grew tired. And, and God sent them some quails in. He said, I'm not going to send you in quails to eat one day or five days or 20 days. I'm going to send you enough to eat for a month. And he said he let the quails fall. Numbers chapter 11, verse number 31, a wind from the Lord that brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp a day's journey from the camp, round about the camp, two cubits high. That'd be three feet high. That's a lot of birds. Now imagine they had to come from Africa and they blew all the way across the Red Sea. I don't know of any quails that swim. The ones I used to shoot had wings, and I loved to shoot them. But he brought them in three feet deep. <laughs> yeah. Well, they saw them. They didn't want to see no more after they got through with these. He said, while the meat was yet in their mouth, they began to throw up, and the meat came out their nostrils. And they named that place Kibroth. Hadaba, they buried the people that lusted. They made a graveyard out of that place where they were eating those quail. I don't believe it was God's will for them to eat any quail. Amen. But the journey of the camp. Let me give you this one thing and then we'll, we'll stop. In Numbers chapter 10, verse number 12, the journey of the camp. God told, them, told Moses, said, you've been here in this place too long around Sinai. Sinai meaning a bush or enmity. That's the place where the law came down from. And so they made their journey from the wilderness in Arabia, from Mount Sinai. They came to Paran. Paran means beauty, glory. So God took them from that place of law, Sinai, fire, smoke, wilderness, Arabia, to Paran. A place of beauty and glory. That was the first journey that they made from Sinai. And can I tell you that uh, we're, we're kind of living in Arabia right now, but we got a place going to. Amen. We got a place that we can look forward to, a place of beauty and glory. Our Lord Jesus Christ is there, our great high priest who has been making, making intercession for us, in which we stand per, per, perfect before God. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Thank God we don't have to live here forever, but we have a place that 